So I'm grateful to be here today, and I hope you're grateful to be here today. It is a holiday, and uh, you guys have made it, and that's got to be like 90% of success today on a holiday weekend. Just being here, just showing up, you've done great. If you're joining us online, I'm glad you're joining us online as well. This will be a really fun morning, a morning where I think you're going to be thinking about some things. I think you're going to be thinking. I hope you're going to be thinking about some things. We're going to continue our series on love. It's the eighth week. I hope you're not being worn out by love. We're not going to do 15 weeks. We're going to be wrapping it up in a couple weeks, but it's our eighth week. And today we're going to be talking about sort of the completion of the thought from last week when we talked about love not being easily angered. And uh, today it's going to be very simple. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, I have a friend, um, an assistant, Theo Wheely. If Theo, if you'd come, come up here and help me. Uh, Theo is going to be doing something here while I talk to you. And uh, Theo is going to be drawing a picture for me on an Etch-A-Sketch. Come on up here, buddy. You guys might remember Theo from a couple months ago uh, as he assisted me in the worship service there with um, uh, holding a, a balloon and walking across stage. He is now the assistant pastor, and I hope and someday he can take over and be up here and I'll be down there assisting him. Um, Theo is going to draw a picture. I'm going to talk to you. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 together. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love, agape love, never fails. Love keeps no record of wrongs. We're going to find out today um, if you're pretty good at this or maybe not so good at this. And I'll confess to you right off the bat. This is one of the ones that I struggle with. And I struggle with a lot of them from time to time. But for me, it's not the long-term record of wrongs that I keep, but it's the short-term, you push me, I'm going to push back. You say something, I'm going to say something back. It pops up in marriage. It pops up in closest relationships. It's just being prickly like a porcupine when there's no need to be prickly at all. And it's one of the things that I want gone from my life and I want gone from your life. So let's talk about it. When the apostle Paul uses the word record, he uses it on purpose. And he said, love keeps no record of wrongs. Now, the word record is an accounting term, and it literally means to keep track, like an accountant would keep track of your dollars and cents, your income and expense, your accounts payable, accounts receivable. And in accounting, you don't approximate. Um, philosophy, theology, and accounting don't have a lot to do with each other. They're in different buildings in, in college. And, and an accountant can be a good philosopher or theologian, but you have to think with a different side of your brain. There's dots and, and decimal points and columns and accuracy that, well, if you make mistakes, everything falls apart. Now, the same could be true or the same could be said for philosophy and theology. But man, this accounting thing, I mean, we take it really, really seriously. And so this is an accounting term that's used many times in scripture. And one of the ways that it's used is in Romans 4, 8, where the apostle Paul again tells us that blessed are the ones who sin the Lord will never hold against us or never count against us. And what this literally means is if you're going to keep no record of wrongs, you're not going to put any infractions or offenses or wrongs that somebody else does to you or, you know, to me, in a column where you're going to remember it and come back and reconcile the books later. That literally, you look at the offenses or the wrongs committed to you, and you decide you don't owe me anything. And you don't decide it later. You don't decide it a week later, a month later, a year later. You decide it real time. As soon as it happens, you let it go. Now, my friend here, Theo, has been making a picture. We had to teach Theo what an Etch-A-Sketch was. Do you know that um, he was like, where do you plug it in? <laughs> There's no LCD screen. Uh, and Theo's a smart kid, so he figured it out really, really quickly. Um, but Theo, you've been drawing a picture, haven't you? Hop on up here. Now, it's impossible to see the picture. We can't zoom in close enough. But you guys, if you're of any age, you know what an Etch-A-Sketch is. He's been working on a picture. And um, there is a picture, and it really happened, and it's there, and you see it. Now, if we're going to keep no record of it, then that means we're going to erase it right after it happened. 
How do you erase an Etch-a-Sketch? Do you remember what we taught you? Shake it hard, 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 yeah. And you know what? If we look at it, it looked like a picture of downtown Des Moines from the air a minute ago. And now it looks like nothing. There is no record of the picture at all. There is no record of wrongs. Thank you, Theo. You can go back to your seat. Good job, my friend. You want me to take that? Okay. Wait, yeah. Do you actually keep this? You can, you can uh, play with it during church if you want to. Yeah. He wants to get paid. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit um, about some instructions that the Apostle Paul has that deal with really with forgiveness, because to live this way, we have to make sure that we have forgiven the offenses of the past, but that's really not all that we are uh, gonna be talking about, because you have to make sure that the offenses of the past are gone, that you've forgiven them, all of them and every one, for you to be able to move forward and live in the moment and the future with this gift of a short memory, the gift of like Teflon spirit or soul, where when things happen, and I don't mean massive things that are dangerous things, that are um, things that threaten your life or threaten you know you as a person or your family. I'm talking about insults. I'm talking about uh, debts. I'm talking about things that happen in human interaction where you're liable to retaliate, tit for tat, quid pro quo. Say something to me, I'm going to say something to you. Uh, to just be willing to let things go. So the Apostle Paul talks in Colossians a lot about forgiveness, which is the foundation for being able to let things go and to live. And so we're gonna talk about that for the next 10 minutes or so. And then we'll come back and we're gonna talk about what it's like to be willing that even though offenses come, to choose not to live offended, not to try to get even and not to keep score. You guys remember Tuesday? Tuesday, we had some tornadoes. How many did we have? 26 tornadoes, 28 tornadoes. An F4 went through and destroyed, uh, you know, one of our, our towns very close to us. And people in our church were affected. We even have some in here who had massive trees down in their yard. And, and uh, I was talking to my wife, you know, about this because, um, you know, neither of us are from Iowa. And uh, neither of us, of us were really raised with the tornado threat. You know, Joy was from Arkansas. They kind of had them, but not really. And I was raised in South Florida where we had hurricanes that we weren't scared of at all, which we probably should have been. And tornadoes kind of came in the hurricanes, but you didn't really think about them. It just wasn't a thing. And so Joy and I were talking and she's like, well, if a tornado comes, she goes, I don't know how I feel about being stuck in the basement with the house collapsed on us for five days. She goes, maybe it would be better to be dead. Now that was very dramatic, right? But I mean, she's trying to decide whether or not she wants to be trapped or whether she wants to be dead. And I said, well, you choose. And she goes, well, I don't know. I guess being dead would probably be better. So I said, all right, we're together, ride or die. You and I will just, you know, be up here on the top floor. If something comes, then, you know, we go to see Jesus. At least we're going together. I've seen that movie, Twister, you know, it'll be fine. And so the storms come and um, Joy and I are upstairs and, you know, I'm not terribly worried because I'm watching, you know, and I know that the, they're around, but they're not like, you know, right in our backyard, Prairie Trail, you know, we're safe so far. And so I go out on the front porch and, and, um, and I'm an Iowa now, I've been here seven years and I'm recording the storm with my, with my camera and, um, you know, Joy's inside and I'm like, yeah, we're going to together, Joy and I, you know, all the way. And so the wind is blowing and I'm on the safe side of the house. It's blowing, 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 blowing. The trees are laying down in the median of our road. And then all of a sudden the trees flip back the other direction. And I'm like, uh oh, I gotta get out of here because that's a bad sign. And so I go take off into the house to find Joy to go to the basement. And she's already heading downstairs <laughs> and she's got a bag. And, and I look at her and she has two watches on, my watch and her watch. She's got a bag and, and, and she, I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, I'm going down. I, you know, the tornado's coming. And I said, what do you have? And she goes, well, I have some clothes because you know, if I'm down in the basement and stuck, I wanna be you know, able to put my clothes on. And if I'm on the news, you know, I wanna be able to look presentable. <laughs> You've seen those people and you know, I think they get, they do, they get dressed to be on the news. It's like, and, and so, shouldn't you have told me about your plan? You know, if we were together, aren't we going to go downstairs together? Were you going to leave me on the front porch and you were going to go downstairs fully clothed with my watch and your clothes and everything that she didn't want to blow away. But the point was, is that she didn't know what was coming, but she did know she needed to clothe herself and she needed to be in a spot where she felt comfortable. And so she was taking her go bag, forgot her husband, but she was going to be prepared. Colossians, the Apostle Paul's writing a letter to a church that he hadn't visited by this time or about this issue, but had heard about these issues. And they were having a problem with Jesus uh, as Lord. They didn't believe Jesus was Lord. They had issues with that. And so he wrote the, this letter to them 
There was some conflict about which leader they were going to follow. And he's just teaching them how to relate and to react with each other. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. He's saying, put on your clothes, get your go bag and make sure you take the right things to put on for whatever happens next. And you don't know what's going to happen next. Make sure that you put these things on because they will prepare you for the tornadoes of life to come. Clothe yourselves with compassion, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, if any of you has a grievance against anyone, forgive them just as the Lord forgave you. Over all these things, put on the belt of love, which binds all of it together. Love makes it make sense. And it allow you to live in perfect unity. So first of all, we clothe ourselves with four things. We don't have a lot of time to talk about these four things, but these four things are critically important. The first thing that we put on is a heart of compassion, that we pray that God makes us compassionate and see the needs in other people. Now, at the end of our time in the second teaching session, we're gonna come back to this and talk about how important it is to give the benefit of the doubt, to realize that people are entitled to have a bad day, to view life through what they may be going through and not how their behavior affects me. But this heart of compassion literally means to be able to be moved with emotion by the pain and circumstances of others. Kindness, mellowing anything in me that might be harsh. That's as, uh, uh, the best definition I could possibly give. Where there are harsh places in your life, where you feel prickly, where the boards need to be sanded a little bit, smooth them out, God. Put on a heart of compassion, a desire to smooth the prickly places, humility, thinking not less about yourself, but just thinking about yourself less often. Make me less preoccupied with me and more preoccupied with you. Gentleness, willing to suffer injury before always choosing to inflict it. And then finally, patience. It's the word macrothumia, one of our favorites, which is patience with people. The ability to endure, not to re seek revenge, even though we can and even though we might be really good at it. It is the choice to let it go. Now, I want to remind you, I'm not talking about things that threaten you with your life or threaten your family or things that are dangerous. The principle we're talking about from 1 Corinthians is a principle that relates to interpersonal offense, to being angry over things that might be significant, but at the end of the day, aren't really that important. But the apostle Paul is getting to the heart of this issue and he gives us two instructions that allow us to put these things on, two assumptions that allow us to put these on. The first one is, he says, bear with one another. And I think this is a really important concept. Think about your marriage. We talked last week about some of the things that you never do when you fight when you're married. One of the things you never do is you never threaten divorce. Why? because you've made a commitment to bear with the other person, that you're going to be with the other person, that families are families and they stay together. Now, I know sometimes that doesn't happen, but it's the goal, it's the aim. And a family stays together. And when your husband or wife knows that you're going to bear together, that you're going to live together, that you're gonna make allowance for the other person's faults, that when you know them, even if they're things that are, that are disappointing or things that are hurtful, that you're not going to leave. It starts with the relationships closest to you, works its way out to your children. Maybe your relationship with your parents, with your coworkers, especially with a church family. And the principle here is you can't really love with one foot out the door. If one foot's out the door looking for what's better or what's next, then it makes you critical of what you have and what is. And you see the grass as being greener on the other side, but in reality, you just need to water your own yard. And the apostle Paul says, first of all, you bear with one another that I am in it for as long as it takes, no matter what it takes, because this is who and where God's called me to be. 
And then he says, forgive one another. And the way that this is worded is great because he says, you're part of them, they're part of you. And so literally it's talking about really forgiving yourselves, but it doesn't mean you're forgiving yourself. It means yourselves are part of a family. So of course you forgive because it's what Jesus has done for us. And he even says, forgive the way that the Lord Jesus Christ forgave you. Now I've done devotions for you. I've written some devotions for you guys again this week. And the first three days are going to be focused on the idea of forgiveness because you have to deal with the past before you can live in the present and embrace this characteristic of love where God's creating in you a heart and a desire to let things go, to not exact revenge, to not push every time somebody pushes you. And so on Monday, we're going to be talking about the idea of forgiveness and the reality that some of us just aren't there and don't want to be there. And we're going to talk through 10 things that forgiveness is not. Now, these aren't new things for you. We've talked about them before, but I'm reminding you. On Tuesday, we're going to work through a list of people in your life who you've had a hard time forgiving. And I'm going to encourage you and teach you how to pray for them. And this is, you know, going to be work. But remember when I told you in January that this was going to be a year where we grow? where we transform, where we train to be godly. And I promise you that if you just stuck around, that if you came on Sundays, that if you leaned in a little bit and you were part of the things that going on in the church, that you were tracking with the studies, um, that I would do everything that I could possibly do. And I can't do everything, but I can do some things because I'm your pastor and I love you. And so I'm trying to provide things for you as you lean in to do the hard work of growth and anything in life that's worth achieving is gonna stretch you a little bit diet, going to the gym, being in a marriage relationship or a dating relationship, going to school, growing in your relationship with the Lord. So the only way you're not going to grow is if you choose to disconnect. And if you choose to disconnect, that's between you and the Lord. But if you lean in and connect, regardless of what it is, God's going to allow you to grow because you're doing the work and the Holy Spirit is going to do the work in you but I've written the devotions for you and there's nothing magical about the devotions except for the fact that they're related to the themes we've been building all year long. And we are in our fifth month. Um, Pastor Jared and I put something together for you this week that I hope will be helpful for you. Some of you said that you're driving to work at 7 a.m. when the push notifications come. And, uh, and so I recorded, did audio recordings of each of the devotions um, this last week of the five days so that you'll have a push notification with the audio or the, the uh, printed version. If you download the PDF the way that you've been downloading the PDF through social media or the QR code at the end of the service, there's a link embedded in the QRF that will take you, trying to make it as easy as possible. Monday, the idea of forgiveness and are you even interested in pursuing? Tuesday, have uh, who are the people I need to forgive still and how can I pray for them? Wednesday, six things that will tell you whether or not you've been able to forgive or whether you haven't, whether you've truly forgiven. And then on Wednesday, I'm assuming that we're ready to really dive into this 1 Corinthians 13 and live with the, the commitment to let it go. And so we start building Thursday and Friday, these characteristics into our lives, and we're going to do it together. And it's really, really important. Above all else, put on love, clothe yourselves with love. We've been learning about love for eight weeks because love is the belt that holds all of this together. But I think this thing is probably one of the things in my life that I want gone the most. And I do a pretty good job in the big things about not hanging on to an offense. Pretty good job, I've learned over the years. But in the small things, in the little interactions in life, and the little accidental bumps with my wife, the people close to me, Sometimes my reactions, well, they're really not what I want them to be. And if there's an offense, whether intended or accidental, in between the offense and your reaction, there's a gap. There's a gap in time. And on Thursday, we're going to be talking about the gap the entire day. And I've made the GAP an acronym and it's kind of dumb, but it works for me. GASP, action plan. 
when something happens, when your wife says something to you and you're like, how could you tell me how to drive? Why did you tell me how to stop? I saw that truck, right? Whatever it would be. You gasp. I can't believe that she said that. Doesn't she know I know how to drive? Doesn't she know I don't run into cars all the time when she's not with me? Why does she think I'm such a bad driver? There is a gasp. And then in, in the middle, that there is an action. But the problem is, is that actions are often reactions. And reactions are caused by our hurry and our temper. Reactions are actions without a plan. The P is a plan where we prepare and pray and plan ahead of time that Jesus Christ is going to be the Lord of the gap and that we are going to forgive and keep no record of wrongs that we're gonna let grace live in the gap. And it's really hard, but it's a promise that it's something that God will do through us. All right, we're gonna apply this together, but first I just wanna invite you to, um, uh, on Father's Day, we have a baptism service that we have scheduled and it wasn't a scheduled service, but one of the reasons that we uh, removed the big center screen that we used to have, if you've been with us for a few years, um, is so that you uh, know, or we can respond when you guys want to be baptized and you have a, a desire and a date and there's no conflict or conflict sometimes, we can adjust and be flexible with you. And so uh, we've decided to have a baptism service on, the, on Father's Day, which is the 17th, the 19th. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, and if you would like to be baptized, I wanna encourage you to do that. What better time to do that than on Father's Day? A couple of my good friends have chosen to be baptized and we're gonna to get to do that um, in that worship service. And I would love to include you in that. And so if you would like to be baptized, and baptism occurs in a believer's life after they've made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, so after you've made a personal profession of faith, you have confessed sin, you believed who Jesus is and chosen to follow him as your savior and Lord, uh, then Jesus commanded us to step out and to be baptized, identify him with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus and to publicly identify with the body of Christ saying, I'm one of you guys. I have become a believer and it's going public. So a child can't be uh, baptized in that way. That's like a dedication and it's beautiful and it's meaningful for the parents, but certainly not for the kid. Um, a christening or things like that are important and significant for the parents in the church, but it's not a personal decision for the child. It's a time baptism for us after we've been able to make a decision to step out and demonstrate that decision. So I would love to baptize you. And if you would like to be, you can let me know, any of our pastors know, you can fill out a card and drop it in one of the boxes on your way out. You can let us know through the app on the website. Any way you wanna get the word to us, we'll be happy to follow up with you. Cannot wait for that service coming up. All right, we're letting Jesus be the Lord of the gap. And I've mentioned to you that I'm not great at this stuff when it comes to the little things, especially. So ah, it's time for confession, I'll just confess. Joy and I are getting ready to go yesterday. Saturday, keep in mind, I spent all week studying for this message and writing devotionals to help you grow in your personal relationship with Jesus so that you can get good at this stuff. And um, we're getting ready to go and normal Saturday morning, had a couple cups of coffee, everything's going well. And, um, you know, Joy just looks at me and, and, you know, we're kind of, you know, bustling around just trying to get showered and dressed and everything. And she's like, hey, she goes, are we gonna go to Home Depot after we get dressed and ready? And, um, that was a normal question, it was fine, right? Anybody could ask that question. But I had to hear the question like a disagreeable person. And I answered to her when she said, hey, are we gonna go to Home Depot after we get dressed and ready? I said, no, we ought to go to Home Depot before we get dressed and ready. <laughs> I know, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> and I just said it, and I don't know why I said it, I just did. I wasn't mad. I was having a good Saturday. It just popped out. Now, Joy had been offended, right? I did it. I mean, she didn't deserve it and um, she received it. I was guilty. Whatever came back to me, I most likely would have deserved. And do you know what she did in the gap? Do you know what her reaction was? Gentleness. She looked at me and she was like, well, that wasn't very nice. And she just walked on. 
just moved on with the morning. Didn't hold it against me, didn't huff one time, didn't make me pay for it, didn't bring it up later in the day. She just let it go. And I thought, man, I want to be like that. Because where I deserved a slap, she let grace live in the gap. Matthew chapter five, Jesus talks about this. Now, Paul talks about forgiveness. Jesus is talking about insults. And we're gonna talk about slapping. Are you ready? Slapping. So uh, you probably heard about this. I hope you have. Maybe you've heard this passage and used in a, a way that's not right. But if I just wanna try to clear it up for you. Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Anybody heard that? Oh, come on. I, I, I sense it's a little sleepy in here. I just gotta be honest with you. Um, you know, it's a holiday weekend. I get it. I, you know, but I mean, we're almost there. This is really important stuff. So have you ever heard an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Ever heard it? Yeah. Okay, good. It's in the Bible. Did you know that? Yes. In Exodus mentioned three times. It's also the Hammurabi code. It was also used years before Hammurabi for a way for justice systems to mete out justice. And Jesus said, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And then he said, but I tell you, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, there are four themes here that are really hard to deal with. And I'll be perfectly frank with you because we're friends. I wrestled them all week this week. I don't have time to talk about all four of them. Three, the other three, the last three that uh, I'm not going to talk about are in my notes. And I encourage you to do study on your own. But I'm going to talk about the first one. And that is when somebody slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them your other cheek also. But before we get there, I want to talk to you about the Hammurabi Code. Because so many Christians misuse this and say, well, the Bible says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The Pharisees did that. And they turned that into a personal relationship guide instead of a legal system meeting out justice. It was used three times in the Old Testament. In Exodus, it even said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a bruise for a bruise, all the way down to it was tit for tat, this for that. And it was the punishment must fit the crime exactly and many of us, if we've studied history, know it as the Hammurabi, Hammurabi Code. It was a step toward civility, a step toward good treatment to people who had done infractions. Because if you made the wrong person mad, they could take your life. If you stepped on their shoe and scuffed their Nikes, they could shoot you and it would be okay because they had the power. So it was a way to readjust the power structure. Oftentimes the sentences were decided by the courts, but the sentence was carried out by the person who was the victim. So you may in fact get to slap somebody, but it would only be if a judge allowed you to slap somebody. So it was a situation that brought people back toward fairness and had no uh, bearing on interpersonal relationships. It had nothing to do with marriage. If your wife calls you a bad name, then you can call her five bad names. If someone cuts you off in traffic, you can flip them off. If somebody calls you this word, then you can call them that word because they did it to me, they deserve it, so I'm doing it to them. Jesus said, you've heard that that's been the way that it's been handled because the Pharisees had turned this into their personal relationship guide and you weren't gonna do anything to them that they weren't gonna make right. And boy, they would step up as soon as they thought you did anything and they were the most prickly group of people who you could possibly imagine and nobody could see any Christianity in them whatsoever. And Jesus said, you've heard that it's done this way, but you have to understand it's not done that way at all. Um, he says, I want you to, to, to not resist an evil person. Now this is not talking about physical violence and it's not talking about someone trying to take your life or the life of your family. We'll deal with that in a second. I wanna to talk to you about weapons and warfare and home defense in just a second. What I'm talking to you about are offenses or insults. And he says, don't resist an evil person. In other words, don't pick fights with everybody that picks a fight with you. Don't feel like you have to fight everybody that wants to fight with you. Someone says something to you, you don't have to say something back. You can look the other way. Somebody does something to you, you can go, okay, whatever. That's your problem, not my problem. I'm gonna move on. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These four Themes of non-retaliation are mentioned in the Constitution, interestingly enough. And I, don't, I do not recommend you study the Constitution instead of Scripture. But these four that Matthew 5 mentions, dignity, security, liberty, and property, are all talked about in their ways for meeting out justice in societies, not 
principles for interpersonal reaction. So Jesus said, when somebody slaps you on the right cheek, then turn the other cheek. And that's a hard one. Somebody punches me, then that's dangerous. I got to punch them back. We're not talking about a punch at all. We're talking about a slap. And a slap in the face in Jewish society was the most demeaning and contemptuous act that anybody could possibly do. And if you're faced off with somebody and I slap you with my right hand or punch you with my right hand, I'm going to hit you in the left cheek. And most people are right-handed and that could be aggressive. That could be something that hurts you. That could be something that requires some kind of a response. But this was a slap. If I'm slapping you on the right cheek, it would be a backhanded slap, which would have been an insult, which would have been me saying, you aren't worth my time. I'm erasing you from significance. I'm challenging your character and your integrity. It was just simply an insult. It was just an insult. Would it hurt? Maybe a little bit. Was it dangerous? No. There were slaves who said they would rather be um, beaten with a rod than slapped in the face with their master because of what it meant and how negative difficult it was in their society. Jesus was talking about insults, not about self-defense, not about war. Let's look at this real quick because I've talked to many people this week about this passage and these things continue to come up and Christians misinterpret this a lot and sort of extrapolate this into things to fit an agenda. You can have whatever view you want to have on weapons, warfare, and home defense. That's between you and God. But this passage has nothing to do with it. The first thing, owning weapons. Some people say, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. You can't own a weapon. Those two things are not logically consistent. Jesus' own disciples carried weapons. Does it mean you have to? No, it doesn't mean you have to. But it means you can't say nobody else can because the Bible says this because the Bible simply doesn't. In Luke 22, Jesus said to his disciples, at the time of his arrest. But now if you have a purse, take it. That makes sense. And also if you have a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy a sword. Why would Jesus say that? Because he knew that there were times when swords were necessary. And he was suggesting to his disciples that they be prepared. When are those times? I don't know. But my point is, even in the garden, when Peter whips out his sword and tries to take off Malchius's head, but cuts his ear off, Jesus didn't say, why are you carrying a weapon? I've told you, we're nonviolent. He said, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. And he healed Malchius's ear, which simply means if you live a violent life, you're going to die a violent death, most likely. If you do own a weapon, I think these three things are true. One, we're called to be peacemakers if possible. We should obviously honor God with it. And we should be subject to all of the laws of our land according to Romans 13 and 1 Timothy chapter two. Now it's controversial, it could be political, it's preference, but it's not biblical. We sometimes make things that are preference and political biblical and we can't do that. Number two, it's not just about owning weapons, it's certainly not about home defense. Well, if someone breaks into my house, I've heard people say this, and threatens my family, I have to turn the other cheek. Proverbs says you're a fool if you do that. And in Exodus, the principle was given. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and struck a fatal blow, the defender, the homeowner, is not guilty of the bloodshed. But if it happens during the day, the defender is guilty because they don't need to do it. It would be retribution. It would be excessive. And that was the principle that was laid out in Scripture. Don't be excessive. Be fair. War. We may hate war. Nobody loves war. And nobody understands all the time why wars exist and if they even should, the ones that we fight and don't fight. But war in principle is not something that the Bible outlaws or prohibits. King David, a man after God's own heart, says, praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Now he also, because he had blood on his hands, wasn't allowed to build the temple. There were consequences for living that life, but it wasn't the bloodshed God asked him to be involved in. It was the stuff he chose on his own. Ecclesiastes says, there's a time for everything, a season for everything under the heavens, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This is what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter five. You worry about your character and let me worry about your reputation. Quit returning insult for insult. Quit shoving every time you're pushed. 
be willing to let things go. Ask for the gift of thicker skin, a Teflon soul. Because if you are so prickly and demanding and combative that every time you're agitated, you respond with a reaction, no one will ever see Jesus in you. There is a sociological term, and I wanna share it with you real quick and something that we don't have to really make that um, complicated. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And it goes like this. We excuse our actions based on our circumstances, but everyone else's actions are because they have bad character, right? So somebody does something to you, they cut you off in traffic. It's like, well, that person's a jerk there or whatever, were they raised by, you know, we just all of a sudden decide they're terrible people. But when we do it, we didn't see them or we had a bad day or our kids were acting up or we didn't get enough sleep or when I smart off to my wife, right? Well, it's because I don't feel well or I have a headache. But if she smarts off to me, it's because, are you a terrible person? Did you wake up this morning with the intention of trying to destroy my day? It's, it's the fundamental attribution error. And we have to overcome that and realize that, that love gives the benefit of the doubt. That we have to choose to view life from a point of grace. Do you know that everybody in this room is fighting a hidden battle? That maybe one other person knows about but most likely nobody. Every single person is fighting a hidden battle. And we have to choose to view them through the eyes of grace or the eyes of suspicion and doubt. Everyone's entitled to a bad day. I cannot tell you if you've got kids at home, one of the most important things I learned as a parent is that kids are allowed to have a bad day. They can't have terrible actions just like adults can't, but they can have a bad day. It's all right if they're having a bad day, let them have a bad day. Have a bad day with them. You don't have to drive them into submission. Wipe that look off your face. Don't give me that attitude. I mean, you got to pick your battles, right? But I mean, if somebody told me to wipe that look off my face every single time I had that look, that'd be kind of tough. It's not just kids though. Your wife's allowed to have a bad day. Your friends are allowed to have a bad day. Your staff, your coworkers. Let them have a bad day. It's okay. Be with them in their bad day and choose to live from a place of grace. Well, some people really are kind of hurtful people and they just love to hurt, but hurting people hurt people. And this is a hard one, but you have to ask yourself what in their life has happened to cause them to live from this perspective, to live this way. Maybe you've dealt with this quite a bit. Maybe you're even conflicted now on how to handle this. I've laid awake nights wanting very badly to fight back, to defend reputation, to set records straight and end up after prayer and sometimes losing sleep with the understanding that not only is it futile, but if you do it, what's lost is someone else's ability to see Christ. And they have to be able to see Christ through you. So we have to choose what battles to fight. Let's sum this up, going back to 1 Corinthians 13, as we're about ready to go. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It doesn't dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, and it's not easily angered. And here it is for today. Love keeps no record of wrongs. The call ahead of you is so much more important than the offense behind you. So is it behind you and are you willing to let it go? Well, we're gonna work on it all week. And there'll be a QR code behind me that you can, if you would like to scan for the PDF for the Monday through Friday devotions, these take five minutes, it's not much time out of your day. If you have the church app downloaded, notifications turned on, it'll be pushed to your phone every morning at seven. Facebook, YouTube, all of our social media outlets, our app, our website, you can download these. Let's work through this together this week. This could be one of the most important weeks that you have had so far. Father, thank you for the time we've spent and I pray for my friends who are here 
This is a really hard one. There's just something that lives deep down within us that pops up at the worst moments and shows the ugliness of the sin nature that still lurks in some of the hidden places. And I just pray, Father, that you would get rid of it in my life and in our lives for the sake of our relationships, but ultimately for the sake of our calling. The offense behind us is just not nearly as important as the calling in front of us, our mission. And we're on mission together. So I pray for my friends. I pray that as we lean into this this week, that you would change us, that we would live differently, that you would free us. We would continue to grow in love. I pray these things with confidence in the name of Jesus. Amen.